the One on One podcast with your host, Juan Ayala. Prepare to have your mind blown. Welcome to the One Within All to another episode of Interverse Podcast. I'm here doing a swap cast. Can't believe this is my first time doing an official swap cast. <laughs> Like, when did I actually start this gig? <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, so I guess the rules with that are that we're going to be also hosting this episode on one-on-one, the uh, the feed over there. So whichever you're hearing this on, welcome to the show, whether this is a one-on-one for you or an interverse or somehow both. I don't know, but we got the rabbit hole master finally here for an actual one-on-one with Juan. Having never done that yet, even though we've done some great stuff with our Sorcerers of Scientism series. Yeah, Juan's a guy that goes deep into the deep into the conspiracy rabbit holes. He knows all about the lizards and he's ready for a, a good time, I'm sure. So what's up, my brother? You know, it's you want to introduce had... me? This is kind of weird. I've never done this. Yeah, so this is Chance, everybody. I'm Juan from the Juan Juan podcast. We'll post each other's links in the description and i can't believe you haven't done how many episodes are, how, how deep are you bro how many episodes have you done oh man like 350 damn and you've never done a swap cast <laughs> never like whatever this is where yeah it's technically a swap cast never done that that's crazy yeah i think i've done over yeah probably close to 200 episodes i, I had a few shows that i was doing then i stopped one then you know, it was just too much because as you can tell, Chance, I mean, I'm a guy who d- has too many projects going on at the same time. So I tend to can spread relate. myself. Yeah, so I, sp- I spread myself a little bit too thin sometimes and you can get burned out. You know what I mean? Especially looking into the subjects that we're looking into and doing the research that you're doing. It can get it can uh, it can literally sucks your energy away. It's a weird what's the whole thing that you talk about psychic vampires i like that shit i like that a lot oh yeah yeah i've done a lot of research into psychic vampirism it's a real thing although i'm more interested in like the actual interactions with psychic vampires in meat space but cyber vampirism is real too now in terms of like getting looshed by looking at conspiracies too much i guess that's a thing as well yeah. uh, sam tripoli would probably say you're giving up a lot of your life force energy just to look into the darkest, dankest corners of the universe you can find. But for me, like the whole conspiracy research thing is just a natural byproduct of trying to get more in tune with truth, right? Which is a a self-discovery journey, but you got to also then be ready to look at like, well, why am I the way that I am? And what are the forces that programmed and put me on this path? And so, yeah, we got to look at things like sci-fi, like we've been doing in that big series with Mario and Gabe and Kaylee, which by the way is awesome. I'm really loving those. I'm glad that we're going to keep doing it. Yeah. I enjoy that shit. And, and yesterday, not to call anybody out, but I had somebody write to me and they're probably going to listen to this episode, but they, they wrote to me. They're like, dude, you're the king of deep dives. I'm like, I'm not a king. I'm nobody in this round. There's plenty of other podcasters that, dive deep and actual do like legitimate research you know what i mean like i like connecting the dots i like when one conspiracy weaves in with the next conspiracy and you see the bigger picture that's what i love but we're all going around in this fish tank of our own ideas because i only know so much about what i learn anything out of that if it's connecting or not i'm not going to know because i don't know the the knowledge and It comes back to what like Plato talks about where he goes, we know everything. We just have to, how was it that somebody put it the other day? It's like, we just have to remember. We already know everything. We just have to remember this knowledge because it's already all there. We just have to connect the, you know, to connect the dots and read about it. And I had somebody asking me yesterday, they're like, where do I start? And I go, it's, it's your gnosis, bro. Like it's, it's your path. Gnosis is whatever's sacred to you, whatever interests you. I always tell people cause they want, and I can relate dude. Cause when I'm ner- learning something, I, ha- I have a, a very OCD 
personality. So I hyper fixate on a lot of things, especially when it, so when it comes to knowledge, I hyper fixate on finding the knowledge, like everything that needs to be learned about that one subject. And I exhaust it until I feel like I've learned all of it and then I'll expand. But it all starts with one thing. And I tell people, I go focus on what you like to learn about. So if it's about reptilians, focus on the reptilians and then talk to people and connect dots. So that's what we do with the weaving and doing these episodes with the, I love the round table style because you start to see the different perspectives of the same idea and you see where it goes. And I, I just love that. And one, one of the things that just makes my nipples hard, that just really shoots me up with like endorphins is just when I say something and I see the other person's face light up, cause I know they didn't know about that or they didn't connect the dots beforehand. And when I see someone's face light up, that's just, to me, it's just like, sure. Like, I love it. You know what I mean? Like, I just love bringing. Gabe is the best at that. He gets, he's like a really high quality witness. And when you bring him something that he hasn't (laughs) made that connection before, he's just like, whoa. (laughs) So yeah, it does give you a rush for sure. Uh, I want to maybe like weave into what you're just saying though. I mean, I like everything you're saying. I love the round tables. We do all the different perspectives are great, but on the subject of, you know, conspiracy research and looking for the truth. I think that it is important to make the distinction between truth and facts. So when I talk about truth as a capital T truth, then you're referring to Plato and that all learning is remembering. Well, I think that there's kind of a distinction to be made between learning universal truth, which is, is remembering because you're learning about yourself because you are universe, you are nature. Mm -hmm. And then like the learning of stories, narratives, facts, because with the type, like here's something I was really impressed with about the last two round tables we did on interverse with you You do a great job of not only doing the research on the, whichever character we're talking about, like Parsons, for example, he was so slippery to me. I kept going over his life story and different videos about him and still felt like I couldn't tell somebody the story of his life from, in a chronological order and get many of the details out. And you're able to do that. You know, you actually not only did the research, but also captured it in your mind and they could relay it as a story, which was very helpful and very impressive. But that, that is the facts. You're getting the facts straight, right? But it doesn't have anything to do with capital T truth, which when Plato talks about it's all remembering, what he's talking about is how anything that is actually true it has the same template that follows nature's template of wholeness. That that's what all the occult or mystical magical correspondences from colors to frequencies to shapes has everything to do with that. That's where, you know, the ring of truth is at whenever you can see those consistencies across systems, how, how the septenary emerges, emerges in everything, you know, one through seven. But what we are doing with our language is we're misconceiving facts and narratives which are more like has to do with things that are artificial or things that are human contrived versus what the universe naturally constantly expresses which is this one fractality of you know the same thing repeating across different dimensions of scale so whenever whenever we can return to that template of wholeness and bring that into what we're talking about to help us see what is and isn't true and distinct make the distinction between that and this is just a story these are just facts this is just history because history is never really true with a capital t you know it's always the story that we got and we're just doing our best with that and it's fun but yeah <laughs> uh, i think that there's two things going on here and it's good to have you know take note of that i mean you you nailed it on the head bro history his story so it's to the victor the spoils and absolutely what you're getting on about we won't really know the whole truth because it's it's what Nietzsche talked about where it was perspectivism where no one actually knows the no one interprets things from a non-biased point of view we can only compare perspectives with one another and that's called perspectivism so when we're talking about an idea i'm comparing my perspective to chance's perspective But at the end of the day, you're going to have your own way of looking at it. I'm going to have my own way of looking at it and not saying that your, your idea is not true, but it's not 
from a non hope, completely non biased place. You know what I'm getting at? Like, it's not like I'm discrediting what you're trying to say, but we all have our own confirmation biases. Like we all have our own things that we look at life from a different lens. And I think that's a very important thing to talk about because when talking about conspiracies and, and getting into this whole woo woo talk and all this stuff, it's easy to get lost in translation. Right. I mean, and I'm a person that I like to recite dates, names and all these things. But at the end of the day, you can only take that for a grain of salt as well, because it's all subjective at the end of the day. It's not a hundred percent ever going to be the truth. This is what the history books have written down. This is what the mainstream narrative has written down that, Hey, listen, and whatever, 1776, the founding fathers, you know, founded the United States. Okay. That's what they've told us. But you mentioned something the other day on, I think it was the Parsons episode where sometimes they give us things that we can't, that we can't prove. So not to get, not to go there, but like flat earth to me, to me, I, I'm not, I'm not a flat earther, but people get pissed off at me. Like I, I'll go on these podcasts and I'll attack flat earth and say how it's fake. But then I'll talk about Tartaria and like hollow earth and how that could be real. Cause to me, bro, it's easy to, to, to disprove flat earth, be Parsons, build a spaceship, go into space and look down. And you'll see if it's round or not. You know what I mean? Is that impossible? No, it's not I don't not know impossible. if that's so easy, though. I don't but it, know how to do it. It's not easy, Chance, but it's not impossible. Okay? It's not It's not something that's out of the realm of being able to achieve that. Because, you, bro, you know about the law of attraction. You know about manifestation. If you align yourself. And the thing about the whole law of attraction thing is people think, oh, if I say it, it'll come true. No. You still have to put the work in. You still have to align yourself and align everything in your life in order to be able to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. So what's stopping you from building a spaceship? And <laughs> this just sounds ridiculous, but going into outer space and looking at, down at the globe, what money, a simulacra that's empty and it means nothing. But if you're able to raise enough, you know what chance let's do this. Let's also, I think a, the firmament is stopping me from doing it, but that's my, <laughs> that's my let's start a GoFundMe to build a spaceship to put you in outer space, bro. So you can look down and see. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't <laughs> want to go. I mean, we can we put you up there instead? No, I got a family chance. I can't do this. I, I, <laughs> we got to put some homie, Romy, homie, Romy. I, I volunteer you bro to, to go into it. Cause he's like on the fence about flat earth. And I'm like, dude, you know what? It's, I don't. So, so the, the point being that there are some ideas that the government and these lizards, these people, right? The, the, the reptilian overlords as I like to call them. And yesterday, again, I got asked how much literature have I read about the reptilians i've never read any books on the lizards like at all i you should read pierre sabac P, hold, hold on pierre sabac pierre. yeah he's got a couple of good books called one the murder of reality hidden symbolism of the dragon and uh, the other book is called holographic culture and yeah i was hoping we'd talk about lizards because i read those books in the last year and they're a really good resource for the symbolism of where all that's coming from. And I and was wondering what, was what you book? think about the whole concept. Oh, we can get into it. What was the second book? Holographic what? Holographic culture. That's the newer one, uh, but they're both worth it. They're dense academic resources for sure. And you so, have to get them. You have to order them from Pierre Sabak oh. He does not put them on Amazon or any kind of e-reader. Got to get the actual oh, book. That's, yeah, he's hardcore yeah. like that. I think he's, you know, he doesn't want the AI to figure out that he's revealing all their secrets by putting it into a digital format. So I know that you want to talk about lizard. We'll talk about lizard. But here's yeah, the we'll thing. get there. Here's the thing, Chance. I also want to also want to like a uh, fight with you about flat earth. <laughs> <laughs> See, Not we really haven't done a Juan on Juan, like a one on one. So this is what this is what I wanted to get you alone and just go back and forth and just have a conversation. Cause I know we have a lot to, to talk about. I want to talk to you about like your frequency work and all this stuff and how oh, all yeah. that works. So I know that you don't subscribe cause I've heard you say it before to the, to the dark, what do you call it? The dark Gnostic worldview about how we're in a false reality. Am I correct on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, I guess the way I put it is the pop culture Gnosticism. I like, like I like the Marty Leeds Gnosticism where he's showing you that everything is is God and that you're also the image and reflection of God. 
I like that kind of Gnosticism, but the version where your body is a prison, this is a prison planet, there's a evil Demiurge Cthulhu monster that is the ultimate boogeyman that's keeping you here enslaved, all of that is like a, a real problematic philosophy that I think the majority of the inverse uh, expressions of world religions that fall flat fall flat and fall short of the true esoteric kernels of truth within those religions uh i think they're all versions of this corrupted gnosticism and it goes all the way into materialism with simulation theory simulation theory is just the same version of gnosticism repackaged in a materialism form and i think all of that is the most disempowering perspective and i could go into that and also the um the logical fallacies in it are ridiculous just full-on retarded bro like if the how could if we how could uh how if this was true like why wouldn't the the real god just snap their fingers and fix the whole <laughs> issue i don't understand so you don't think you don't believe in simulation bro uh, i mean i believe in simulation as a concept but not as like that we're in a computer of sorts now in i mean okay there are there are things about the idea that are not um necessarily fully wrong in the sense that spiritually we simulate all the time uh but simulation is hypocrisy so we want to recognize that the only simulation that we're in is one inside of our own head and that we create it for ourselves. and nobody's keeping you in the simulation you're doing it so that so I will concede some points to these ideas, but I will never concede that there's some external force that is causing us to be trapped in that cycle or repetition because it's all us at the end of the day. I love that. I, I really dig that. So the reason I bring Gnosticism up is it's a, a topic near and dear to my heart because I grew up. And ladies and gentlemen, this is all fully unscripted me and chance are just having a conversation right now so this is this can go anywhere right now so i grew up pentecostal christian right that's that's what i was raised in and a subject that's near and dear to my heart which i dove down very deeply was gnosticism and the reason i bring gnosticism up is because that's where for me the term reptilian overlords has really sprouted from because people ask me all the time oh do you think the lizards are real dude you always talk about them and i always go well there could be some sort of reptilian-esque beings that could exist 100 i mean we have if you want to believe in dinosaurs you know dinosaurs are reptilians really in a way you know they're just huge I don't know lizards if I believe in them either <laughs> sorry man whatever you subscribe to so when i say reptilian overlords i pretty much get at it from the point of the metaphorical sense of the word so these are contic forces that are at work in our world now you made a good point about how you don't believe that one entity is ruling over us and keeping us in prison because according to gnostic cosmology for those wondering the Aldabaoth, which is the Satan archetype, is created this false reality that we're in, where right? we're in the lower eons, the upper eons. Again, the whole upper eons is a metaphysical higher state of consciousness, Agartha, whatever, Shambhala, whatever you want to call it, heaven, you know, whatever place. And what we're experiencing now is hell. Now, there were some sect of Gnostics who believed what you were saying, Chance, that we are angels trapped in a body, we are light beings trapped in this body. And by you giving birth to other, you know, humans, so having kids or whatever, you're entrapping angels within flesh suits, right? That is nihilistic as fuck, though, isn't it? That's fucked. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. It is a very dark, and, and I agree with you, it is a very dark way to view it. But if you really come to think about it, I mean chance if and i want to be careful where where you go with where you know where i go with this because i've had some conversations with certain people where they take it to a very dark place when i start talking about exiting the simulation if you, if you catch my drift okay you know about leaving because you said the only ones who are keeping us here are our own selves now if you're keeping yourself here how would you then exit? And that's where it gets dark. And I don't really like to talk about that because, again, some people, you know, it's a touchy, touchy subject for s certain people. And I've had various amounts of, like, different answers to that question. And, it, again, it goes back to whoever is, is on the other side. So 
And that's why I like the the demi urge, right? Because you're not a hundred percent. And how do I say this? This is this is it can get muddied really quick. Because yeah, there's a like, lot of points in here. I can't wait to expand on. This is great that we're talking about this. Because you go to the part of where are you taking responsibility for your actions or are you going to just blame it on, hey, there's dark forces at work that are trying to keep me here. So this is why I'm acting this. You know what I'm trying to get? At? Like it's like a like a bobbing and, and weaving type of thing. So when I bring up the reptilians, I go, it's these forces. Now, we know that forces can either be good. I believe. And the more I learn about this stuff, the more I learn about religion and mysticism, I'm starting to. I think I broke away from the, the Christian cosmology a little uh, a while back, but I'm thinking it's like the Hindu Trinity where he's the preserver, the creator the and the destroyer. Thing. It's the doctrine the of emanations in all the world religions. Once you get down yes. to it. Yes, absolutely. But here's the thing. What people need to understand is that the world, this, this reality, if you will, needs some order. So just because something bad happened, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It's just, the universe itself maintaining order within itself. You know what I mean? Like it, it has to have, because we know, you know, I go hunting and some people go, Oh, you're killing animals. I'll go, dude, did you, did you know the, the, one of the main things about preservation and conservation is you need to hunt because if there's too many animals in one ecosystem, it's bad. The, the ecosystem suffers. So you need to maintain that balance. If you have a, a, a group of animals that has no predators, they're going to start eventually having to fend for themselves. And that's when you get disease, famine and all this stuff within an ecosystem. So it's the same thing with the, with I feel the world. And it sounds messed up because right not until we're in the middle of it. It's like, oh, Juan, that's easy for you to say. Not until you're in the middle of it that you're experiencing something fucked up happening in your life. Are you going to say otherwise? You know what I mean? Because how I can't even remember how many times like when I was a kid, I would question like if God is so good, why is he letting all this bad shit like? You know, I have a good friend. He's, oh, he's got cancer. Why is he such a good person? Why is God allowing him to have cancer or whatever, you know, whatever the situation may be? And it's like the more I look into it, I go, okay, there's definitely a source that the Greeks talked about and all these ancients talked about. The one, the eman, you know, the emanationist. That's what I love about the emanationist worldview because it's just a source. And from there, reality radiates out. So there's, I believe there's only one God one entity that's ruling everything really but then what you were saying it's like no 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 it's you create your own reality so that's where it gets kind of fuzzy because i want to be empowering and i want to be able to manifest my own reality but then who's in charge who's bro who's the head management who's ruling it all you know what I mean? who's <laughs> up there oh man there's so many things to try to unpack in this so i'll do my best but i actually think that the the gnarliest conspiracy theory that I subscribe to is that nobody's in charge. And I'll try to express that a little better as I go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because you know what? All this concept of Demiurg and Archons, there is a place for that. In It sounds cool. Well, that's true. There's a place for that, a way to conceive of that without being disempowered in and of yourself. Mm -hmm. So where to start? This idea of the doctrine of emanations and all these ascension cults that come out of it, I think that they're missing the point that we exist in all aspects of the fractal of life. So existence is all that exists, right? <laughs> so the idea of escaping from existence is like, hmm, I guess if you want a pure oblivion and nothingness, that's fine. But they're idea of there being something beyond this i'm okay with that i'm okay with i'm okay with that completely i think that really this doctrine of of uh, ascension is generally misconception uh, a misconception of the idea that our consciousness can be localized in different layers of our body at different points uh it you know with the right type of practices to help us perceive it or the right type of clarity in a way I think that our health is the main thing that keeps us sort of locked in this layer of perception. Uh, in these other layers, I look at it like if you had a big wheel, right? Like the Zodiac, for example, like a big circle. Imagine a big circle, concentric rings 
Okay, so uh, as you get as you get closer and closer to the center of that big circle, there would be fewer and fewer divisions in what it is that exists. So there's only so when we talk about the idea of God, for example, that's the one, right? That's where everything, that's the the layer or slice of reality or the dimension of scale of reality where everything is an undifferentiated pleroma mm. and there is no separation. So in that sense, returning to that place is actually the same as the void because whether you have all pure light or pure darkness, if everything is one thing and undifferentiated and unseparated, then it might as well be no thing. This is where you get the idea of abraxas from. Like Jung talks about in the seven sermons to the dead, that the pleroma consists of all things and their opposite. But the reason why we have an existence is because existence or power or effectiveness, any of these concepts, when paired with their opposite, they continue to exist. So existence paired with non-existence does not cancel out because non-existence doesn't exist. Oof. Power paired with powerlessness does not cancel out power because powerlessness has no power, right? Wow. Yeah. So when we talk about even the idea of a, a great demiurge or a Satan, something that's Satan means adversary, right? So something that, well, okay. And Jehovah actually means, um, Jehovah is a verb, actually. It's the self-existing nature and life force energy within all things that has no beginning or end and continues to eternally flow. That's what Jehovah means. So it's not like a character. It's not like a dude up in the clouds with a, a beard who's like watching you. It's this pleroma we're talking about. It yeah. is the it is the self-existing one. So if you were adversarial or opposing or opposite to that, as the idea of the Satan is, or even the demiurge, then you have to be artificial or non-existent by the very nature of being in opposition to that which is natural and self-existent. <laughs> so right there, we have a problem. The bad guy in this entire story is the opposite of existence. So he doesn't exist, right? <laughs> which means it's fiction. But this is why it's so important, the work we're doing in our panel show, The Sorcerers of Scientism, because we're revealing how fiction can actually affect reality through our minds. And that's what the whole idea of an egregore even is. So uh, I've got more things I want to say about this. I don't know how long you want me to rant before giving you a chance to respond. I love but, it, dude. I love learning. it. This, this sort of thing fascinates me and it just shows me how much more I need to learn. You said the seven sermons of the dead, right? By Carl Jung. I have that and I haven't dove in. Quick read. It's a, it's a quick read. I highly yeah. recommend it. I'll check that out. Yeah, go ahead, dude. Do your thing, man. I'm here. I'm here for the long run, dude. I'm I'm excited about this. I love <laughs> That's this. That's where I first learned about Abraxas. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So, okay, I, I have a few notes here of where I wanted to get to. Um, you know, I was listening to Marty Leeds. He does these Gnostic sermons on Sunday mornings. And it's the, in my opinion, it's the real type of Gnosis where it's teaching you about yourself, but not in a disempowering way or with any boogeyman attached. I really like that. Maybe to a fault that he may like, you know, be a little too forgiving or apologetic to certain groups like masonry, but I can forgive him for that because he's really just there for the truth of, uh, you know, the capital T truth, not the his story facts, right? Mm -hmm. Like so, as we made so, that distinction before. Chance, where? Do, so let's get a little personal here. Where do you stand as far as your beliefs go? Are you an atheist? Are you a Christian? Or do you? This, are you stand somewhere in the center? Like, what, and I use those two to just have some more to compare it to. Where do you stand as far as your personal beliefs go? Now, if we were going to put a label on it, I have no idea what I would be. Probably some people would call me all of these things or even bad, <laughs> so-called bad words. Like, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of what I'm getting into would even get associated with Luciferianism. But that is not, <laughs> I am not an ist or an ism. I worship no specific deity. I actually, okay, so there is no Christians in the Bible, for example. That's not a thing, right? It's not a word that's in there. But I do completely respect Jesus Christ on the symbolic level for what it represents. The words mm -hmm. Jesus Christ actually etymologically mean Jehovah is salvation. And what did we already say Jehovah was? It's the self-existing nature of life force energy. So if Jehovah is salvation, and you are to be a follower of Jesus Christ, 
That means you're following nature's law, nature's God. And that would mean that you are, you know, redeemed, if you will, because if you do things the way nature does them, you will be healthy. You will be in flow. Everything will be great. You'll have a, a happiness and a glow about you. And you'll have that alignment required to manifest the things that are best for you and that your free will desires. It's a really important distinction to make here that in my study of psychology, psyche meaning spirit or soul, is that you come to the the truth eventually that this idea of spirit is synonymous with free will. And then that's a whole nother can of worms because you're like, well, what's free will? <laughs> uh, is there even such a thing? You know, because if you if you make choices that are against nature, against Jesus Christ, in the sense that it means Jehovah's salvation, then you will actually suffer the wrath of God metaphorically. Because mm -hmm. if you do things that are not the way nature would do them, it's going to hurt. It's going to kill you eventually. It's going to corrupt you. So we do have free will to make those choices. But whenever we use our will in alignment with nature or what we're calling God, but is not a character, is not a noun, the whole problem with, with all these religions that deify this, that, and the other thing is we're dealing with nouns now when we give it a name. Mm -hmm. And nouns don't exist <laughs> in nature. You know, like you, you see a deer out in the, in, in the woods. His name isn't Jeff. He's not even in his <laughs> mind. He's not even a deer. He just exists and follows they, them, his bro. instincts and what nature would lead him to do. So this is part of where we go astray. This is the difference between facts, stories, narratives, and capital T truth, which is what nature does, always does, and eternally will be and do. So... Uh, but spirit is synonymous with free will. That's what we have. Uh, spirit is also the record of everything that's ever happened and maybe will happen. I don't know about the latter, but for the universe to exist in the way that it does, there has to be this interesting continuity of, of events that whether or not we're able to tap in and know that truthfully, there is a type of Akashic field there that exists mm -hmm. within spirit. And it is part of our I think that it is like memory is a field thing. We can talk about that more when we maybe discuss the biofield tuning stuff I do with the forks, but yeah, um, I'm getting, I'm getting there in terms of like laying this all out in terms of how I see it. We have what I was, was talking about before. And if you want to jump in, I have my notes. I know where I'm at. Is there anything you want to respond to here? Cause it's, yeah. you know, it's also, you're also being interviewed on my show technically. <laughs> <laughs> so we're getting into a realm that, you know, when you when you talk about something, but you don't know the correct term for it or whatever it may be. So I talk about this type of shit all the time, but you're just coming at it from a whole different perspective that I hadn't really looked at it from. So I'm, I'm right now I'm fascinated with what you're saying. And I'm and I'm, you know, all these things that, you know, you're breaking everything down to go, damn, that makes sense. So I'm connecting dots in my head right now that I hadn't connected before. So you're blowing my mind right now. But I mean, what I said at the beginning, I'm only swimming around in the fishbowl of information and knowledge that I have. So when I talk about something like this, I'm talking about it from the Gnostic point of view too. And, and, you know, back to the Gnostics again, where they were self-empowering, it was what they were ruled heretics. Why? Because they talked about you manifesting your own destiny, you having that divine spark within you to be able to ascend and do your own thing. Well, guess what? It goes against the mainstream narrative of the time, which it's a brokered experience, okay? It's a brokered experience to where, no, you can only achieve divinity through us, right? As long as you pay yeah, your middle tithing. Yeah, middlemen, which is parasites. It, exactly. So they take your money, they take your energy, and then they put you in this prism of like, well, you might make it up there but you gotta you gotta make sure you repent for your sins bro it's like wait what and the bro the one thing that pisses me off about all this stuff about like that psychological warfare that they have with people is when you don't interpret something how they want you to interpret it oh no you just need to pray on it you need to ask god for for guidance well who the fuck's god who <laughs> who the fuck is that oh well, he's gonna talk to you he talked to me the other day but it's like, well, how do you know it wasn't you, your own psyche talking to you, bro? Yeah, it's like they need this this character, this noun called God, in order to be allowed in their own mind to have fucking intuition. And not you know? to discredit anybody's beliefs, okay? I, I want to be as respectful as possible, right? Because my whole thing is 
not do what thou wilt. Fuck that. No, no. I say practice what you want to practice as long as you don't hurt yourself or others. Okay. That's my main thing. You know, do if, if you want to worship the spaghetti monster or whatever or Cthulhu for all I give a fuck, that's fine. As long as you don't hurt others or hurt yourself. That's very important because, right, we have, again, diving into Crowley and, and all these other guys, like you see where this where they can you you where you can use that same ideology to be a piece of shit you know what i mean like they can use that yeah. same thing to, to do very dark things and and what i can again this you is get what that I like consider. assassin's creed william burroughs nothing is true everything is permitted type of thing yeah no nah, dude you know there, there's there's there needs to be some lines drawn in in the you know metaphorical sand if you well that's where cross. jesus christ comes in in terms of if you actually look at it like the meaning jehovah is salvation and that understanding that it's telling you do things the way nature would do them and you'll be set now part of that though is the question of like is there a moral aspect to natural law is there such a thing mm. and i think there is i think there is because we see consistently with the exception of i don't know if this is even an exception because i don't know how you even measure it but we know in our own lives that when we do wrong when we wrong others it eats us up it corrupts mm -hmm. us it does damage you know mm -hmm. so you know, we lose sleep over it i think we naturally want to be good and so i do believe that there's a moral aspect to natural law as well for sure see what you're getting at there so i've talked about this before where animals Okay, you see, right? We we have these movies. Okay, I like movies because they're symbolic, and, and and I can't watch movies anymore now. Nowadays, like when I was watching the Sonic movie with my son the other day, I was like, "That's occultic as fuck, man." But hey, it's yeah, a kid's Dr. movie. Doctor Eggman and everything. <laughs> yes, Doctor Eggman. So, you know these borders that we've put on these maps. Animals don't see those borders. They don't care about those lines on that map. They don't. Right. Care it goes about right back shit. into what I was saying about nouns. Because what is another aspect of a noun is a place. Places yes. don't exist either. There's no yes. place. There's no. There's no person, place, or thingness to reality. That's part of the factual reality. When we're talking about truthful reality, there's a separation there. But here's the thing, Chance. The only thing I feel that we lack, so animals don't care about borders, right? When you have an animal in nature, it's nature. Like how you're saying, but animals do create evil. territory, interestingly. Yes, enough. yes, exactly. Animals have territory, man just takes. Okay, so that's the difference. So when an animal is behaving a certain way, it's because of instinct. It's not because they're evil or they're good. It's because of how you exactly what you're saying. They have territory. Now, when it comes to all of this, and I lost my fucking train of thought, <laughs> I forgot what I was going to say, bro. It was well, about the lines on the map. It'll so, come back if you pretend like you don't care. Yeah. It, you know, it, like just the thought to, is stop circular. me. Stop so, me whenever it comes back and you want to jump in. Because <laughs> I want to talk about egregores. I want to talk yes. about archons. I want to talk about these ideas of, of Gnosticism, right? Because mm -hmm. I can even reconcile that this type of stuff exists to a degree, but in a way that doesn't put them in a, put these days in some position of power over us. Right? So first of all, first of all, back to this idea of there being layers of reality that are actually layers of your body, of your existence. You have your physical body, you have your, you have an emotional body, you have an astral body. You have a, I think the dream body might go into that. I couldn't tell you like, now, I couldn't devise an anatomy of all that perfectly. There are different systems that have different ways of looking at it. And when I think about it, I would say probably almost any division system in which you could conceptualize would actually be true because as soon as you apply your spirit, which is your attention, towards a particular conceptualization, you actually give birth to that in your mind. You create those boundaries. In fact, I, I believe all boundaries are self-imposed so when we talk about archons they're like the rulers of the realm right they're the ones that limit us mm -hmm. and uh, as somebody that had an experience one time where saturn was like or whatever the energy of saturn is in terms of archetypes was like hey why don't you just see what it's like without me bro and uh, <laughs> i had this crazy like a uh, i don't know if you call it kundalini or the psychedelic experience where everything uh, the insides came out 
and there were no more boundaries or separations. I had like a whole day of, it wasn't on psychedelics or anything. I had like this whole day of, I couldn't differentiate between anything anymore. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, I appreciate the limiter now. I appreciate that particular being's role in allowing me to have mm -hmm. uh, the experience of reality that we have in this layer of our body. So I think there are layers of our existence that we could actually co we could localize our consciousness into, and mm. that would be akin to the idea of ascension. And also similar to the idea of chakras. I work with nine chakras currently and the two that are above the body, actually kind of 10. If you count uh, a zero chakra for the earth, when I do sound healing. And I found that when we're talking about like the, the most high or maybe the ninth chakra, whatever, uh, that the entire, the entire thing is like a secret. <laughs> it cannot, it's ineffable. It, it's going back to that idea of the pleroma also being the void, right? It cannot be described. It cannot mm -hmm. be defined. If we're talking about the all, as soon as you try to put a description or a name or anything like that on it, that becomes less than what it is because it's actually infinity. So, yeah, because, and Plato talks about that. When you talk about something, you automatically limit it by even putting a name on it, right? In the theory of forms where it's like, well, God is, how you say infinity, but you're already capping him off by calling him God. Like it's like this, again. This yeah, name. that's not it. its name. <laughs> it's so, nameless. I remembered what I was going to say, the, the, the missing. So we have territories and animals and all this stuff. And how you're talking about how it's nouns or imaginary. Now, would you say that we're, that? So I, I subscribe to the idea that all these ancient cultures and all these ancient civilizations, they all had somewhat the right idea. Now it's like a big puzzle, and all the all the pieces are jumbled up, and it's we're missing pieces here and there. I think everyone was right about it, but it's all just misconstrued. Okay, what do you think about I think the I'm idea? Purpose by the days. Well, we can get into that because that's what the reptilian overlords are. So what do you think about the idea that this missing link is language? Like, what do you think about language being, you know, we have the stories of like the Tower of Babel and all this other stuff where language is very important. Do you think that it's been taken and demystified in a way? Because a lot of the things that we're talking about, I'm having a hard time just finding words to describe what I want to what I want to portray, my ideas portrayed. You know what I mean? Because in, in your mind, you can paint a, a whole picture. You can paint a whole universe in your mind. But how am I able to portray that to you? You know what I mean? Like uh, like with the comic books and like ideas about certain episodes, I have it in my mind all laid out already. And I'm trying to bring it forth. Like Again, like an egregore, you're trying to bring it forth into manifestation in a sort of way. Would you say that language is also withholding us from that because i've i've subscribed to the idea that i think language back then was that much more mystical if you will and and that much more powerful and to where we could actually speak you know spelling casting spells law of attraction where you're manifesting things and saying things to where they actually it's like harry bro harry potter i mean that's i feel like it was like that back then they wave a little wand and do a couple th again it's just mantras and 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 sigil magic if you will they're doing sigils in the air and boom they they speak like the full metal alchemist you know the show you know they do all the finger shit naruto what's naruto they do all the finger stuff <laughs> Ma, mudras <laughs> yeah exactly. i don't know about naruto in terms of having ever seen it but yeah, yeah they go like, like that and they fucking spit fireballs or whatever it is that <laughs> they do <laughs> uh, okay so what you're getting into is logos that is a subject okay let's hold on to that thought because it's a very important part of understanding all of this. But I wanted to get... Am I going to learn how to levitate today, Chance? All right, if I knew how, I would tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to... Okay, so let me just finish breaking down the idea of archons for a second. Okay, so in this level, like these different levels of our body and layers of division, you got the source, the undifferentiated, and then maybe the first division is the yin and the yang, right? Mm -hmm. The masculine and feminine force. In fact, like that one and two... I believe is so primary that the reason why we have a septenary that is important is because that yin and yang are still really just the one, but as like mere reflections of itself. So it's still this like sort of pleromic state of like, you know, everything in its opposite. Uh, and then beyond that, when you get into divisions further to create that septenary and then maybe like, a, you know, a baker's dozen 
every layer of division beyond that, the power of logos or manifestation is kind of like divided and reduced, mm, but also oh. when you divide infinity by itself, it's not really reduced in a weird way. So that's why we still have like this power of logos ourselves. but there are so many filters between us and it at the level of division that we're currently localized within that it doesn't seem as instantaneous. It is slowed down through all this system of filtration, which is it's essentially what like chakras and organs and all the different things that constitute our physical experience really are their type of filtrations between us and the pure undifferentiated light or darkness of the void or of the pleroma. You're so, spending some black belt shit right now, bro. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I've thought about this a lot. Uh, so Archons, though, I really think that we, as source, you know, we are the I am. Everything, okay, so if there was one philosophy that really encompassed how I feel about existence is that I, I actually do subscribe to all is self. Now, that is a dangerous but also empowering thing to recognize about universe. And dangerous in the sense that if you have an unbalanced ego and you go around spitting that, like I've seen people do, you can easily trap trip into like this God complex that you're in charge of everybody else and you control everybody and you get all cult leadery or hmm. manipulative. <laughs> you know, I've seen it. I've seen it. And people will say the exact thing all is self, you know, they'll, they'll be, they'll feel me on that, but then they get all off, off balance. So what I mean by that is that any being whether it's Jeff the deer or Juan or me, if you strip away all the identifications that that being has, their name, their memory, everything is removed from the being psyche. And all that is left is that they exist. The feeling that I exist, the feeling that I am, a feeling of selfhood is the same feeling and sense for every being that exists. Maybe even for like crystals and minerals and shit too. So, that is what I mean when I say all is self. Self is existence. It's the same thing. There is no beginning or end to it. So yourself, the true, pure version of yourself, without any of the narrative, the factual, the story, the history applied to it, the ego, not that ego is all bad. It's part of, we want it because that's why we're even here is to have, a, have fun, have a story, play a game, whatever. But that is the supreme being the undifferentiated pure capital S self as the mm. same thing as like the higher will, whatever. So that's you as well. But how did we get here where we have the ability to play pretend like we're not the Supreme being or like that we're not the Pleroma or that we're anything other than the void. <laughs> I mean, why is there something instead of nothing? I think it goes into the idea of the egregore that in the archons, the limiters, the filters, you know, your organs are archons. People say that, or like, you got to unlock your chakras to ascend, or you got to remove your chakras. Some people even say like in the Ascension cults out there in the new age, like you got to remove your chakras if you're going to ascend. But what they are misconstruing, I think, is that you actually, maybe if you want to exist in this type of a, a dimension, you don't have to, and you want to also exist on other layers or localize your consciousness and other layers of your body. You don't have to get rid of this. You just need to expand and, and you can have them simul simultaneously. Uh, so I, I think archons really work the same way as an egregore and same with the demiurge, but I think we created it. I think we even created the they's out there that are the parasites and the middlemen all as a way to help us to uh, cause off the pressure that we are feeling maybe, or that, you know, we or I or self, was feeling about being responsible for everything, you mm -hmm. know, about uh, is a bit much <laughs> to be the all. So we create our own reflections. We cre the, the infinite supreme being creates. Okay. So think about it this way. Genesis chapter one, when they're referring, when, when it's referring to God in the heavens, it actually in the King James version, the, the real version of the Bible, Hey. In, in chapter one, heaven is singular. And then in chapter two, after the creation story, it's referring to heavens, plural, every time. So I think that that's trying to tell you that every every being, every Adam Cadmon, every Eve, is actually a container and holder or a fractal reflection of the entire heaven 
or the entire the the all. And what is the heaven? It's the zodiac. It's the archetypes. It's the archons. We are. There's a lot more to say about archetypes and and how that works psychologically and how we can work with those archetypes in a way that is really empowering as opposed to feeling like there are cons that are like holding us back. But I'll I'll hold it off there and just say that that's how I feel about it. That not that they aren't there, not that there's no archons per se, but that they're only your enemy if that's the story that you're living in. But they're yeah. also your your best friend if you understand that they are there as servitors. We created them as servitors, magical servitors that we uh we also then just let ourselves forget that we made. Yeah, and it goes back to what I mentioned at the very beginning where you have to be very careful the way you word it because it's getting to a point with what you're talking about where you rid yourself of your own responsibilities with it and not phys maybe not physical responsibilities but almost like karmic responsibilities you know what i mean like you're the way that you portray and you move your energy around it's very you can get that if you can misconstrue that you can get into a very dark place where you can become reckless you know what i'm trying to get at like where you can just be like you know what well i'm all is forgiven so fuck it you know i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that you know what i mean like and you just start putting your energy and just doing reckless things with yourself i believe if that's and then what you do to others comes back to you because all is self. So you're really doing it to yourself the whole time. But going back to the Christian cosmology of like, Hey, I can, what are the bro? I mean, I grew up with this. They, the, my entire Me life, too. Hey, I, I was raised Baptist. You can have sin. And then as long as you repent for your sins and, and, and accept God, you know, Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior, all is forgiven. So wait a minute, all is forgiven. Yeah. Everything. Are you sure? Yeah, dude. Oh, that sounds awesome. So then you, know, you have the Catholics that go in there what, weekly to profess their sins, and, and every week they just get, what, forgiven every week? So fuck it. You know, I'm just going to do a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, Sunday comes around, refill that tank, baby. Refill that tank and go back at it. So you see where, and again, not to bash religion, because I think how you mentioned earlier, I think when you said oh, this is where Jesus Christ comes in, I, I believe that christianity again in the right hands can be constructive for certain people because some people do need guidance in this life they're lost they don't know where they stand you know they, they, they don't know what to believe in or who to believe in so i view the bible again from from depending on which point of view you view it from but i see it as almost like a manual in life so at its core it's like don't be a piece of shit you know what i mean yeah be, be a good person and do good, do good by others. And I, that's why. But I remember I when I was in, in church, they were like, by faith, ye shall be saved. Your works don't matter, you know, but I'm over here. Like, I think your works matter quite a lot because it's going to affect how your life goes a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, you can't literally physically live off of faith. Like, oh, I do think need. though, like that idea of redemption. And I think that that exists regardless of whether or not you're like, quote unquote, mm -hmm. saved by Jesus Christ. I think that every every good story has redemption as a part of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, if it's there's the no hero's redemption, journey. You don't feel like the story is complete. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, the hero's if it's journey. not OK, then it's not over. That's mm -hmm. how the universe works. So I think even, I think personally, this is more of a belief, not something that I can like back up maybe. But I think that at the point that you leave this the body. And you go into the bardo or in between state or whatever you want to call it. I think redemption is like whatever needs to happen for you to feel redeemed and for you to change or or understand what you did. I think that'll happen. I think that's what the post life <clears throat> post life review people have is about. Yeah, and so that's why because I have kids right, and I'm gonna pass the tradition on. Okay, like the Christian tradition. So I'm gonna teach them about Moses and about Noah. You know, Moses is a word that means initiate. Did you know that? <laughs> Hebrew no, I didn't. Mo it's Moshe in, in Hebrew. <laughs> the whole story is an allegory for initiation. It's like my son the other day, he, yesterday was asking me about, Dad, what's the what's the moon made out of? And I, and I looked at my wife and I go, it's made of rocks. And then I whispered, it's actually holographic projection that you don't really know that this is all fake and space is fake. So I'm like talking to like a four-year-old, but he can't hear me. He's like, what's the moon made out? I'm like, rocks. Probably it's, it's made out of rocks. And then I whispered to myself, it's just a holographic projection. You will never know. Yeah, I'm using the lunar wave. <laughs> the the hologram type of thing. Yeah, where it looks like a VHS tape tracking yeah. or something. Yeah, I've seen that. I, I, you know, so I'm going to pass on the tradition. 
So they have a base, okay? But when they get to my age, you know, when my two sons get to my age and they start questioning, hey, why is this the way it is? You know, I'm going to give them the freedom to, the freedom that I didn't get, you know, growing up of being able to choose what I want to believe in or not because it was, bro, it was forced down my throat. I can't even remember a time when I ever, you know, whenever I actually wanted to go to church and actually show up because a lot of the times it was just my church bashing other religions. And I go, but those people think that we're the bad guys. But then we think that they're the bad guys. Uh, who, well, who says that this is the right one? Like some dude that some story about a Jewish zombie that came back and, and they're <laughs> eating his body. They're cannibals. What the fuck is going on? You know, So those type of things <laughs> that get you kicked out of Sunday school about questioning the, the very existence of everything. And I think, again, <sighs> I believe in source. I believe that we are, you know, that there is the one, right? Again, back to the Greeks, there is a one. Because a lot of these ancients, they believed in a God. But since it goes against the mainstream narrative of it not being how you said this old man sitting on a throne, looking down at us, making sure you don't masturbate, that's that's where the, you know, that's where everything just gets convoluted and, and fucked up. But you're spending some shit, bro, that, I, you know, I, I wanted to get your thoughts. I don't know if you want to wait for the second hour because I've been just thinking about a lot of things about because we're talking about ascension and about different states of consciousness and all this stuff. But is it a physical thing? Does it really happen? Can I sit in my room and levitate and, and turn upside down and go visit Bigfoot in the astral plane? Or is it all in your head, bro? You know what I mean? Like, is it all in your head or what? what I don't know if you have any answers to those questions. <laughs> I do think it's all in your head, uh, for sure. I mean, I'm I'm definitely down with the hermetic principle of mentalism that all is mind, and in in the mental plane uh, in with the mental body, I've done all kinds of wild shit on really? on astral levels. I used to get, I used to be really into shamanic journey work where you'd use like a rattle and drum track, and go on visionary journeys, if you will. Yeah, uh, I got real information that way. <laughs> I don't know why I don't do it anymore. I just don't feel like, I guess I don't feel like I need that mechanism to help me know where to go in life. But at that time, earlier in life, I actually used that type of shamanic journey work to connect with like animal totem guides and ask questions of spiritual entities and would get led places like, you know, go here, go, go to St. Louis this weekend things like that. And then all kinds of synchronicities would come out of whatever me following, whatever the instructions I got were. Now I feel like, I don't know, I'm in flow enough that I don't need to, or I don't feel compelled to do that type of stuff to get instruction because it seems like there's uh, an obvious path of one foot in front of the other since I've been podcasting. But I want to quote a couple of people here because <laughs> this is, first of all, first of all, Bible is a, a manual on life. Like you said, um, that's my personal belief. I'm not saying it is, that's but my it's a personal. dangerous thing when you get into it as like historically true. Yes. And the whole, the whole slavery system is built on that. And we can talk on that yes. on the histor historical nature of the story. Uh, you can take it literally as in literary, as in its literature. And that's a great, story. but yeah. anagogical is the word you want which means that there's about eight different perspectives that you can take for any part of the Bible and they'll all be accurate. As long as you're not trying to say that it's historical factual, there's all kinds of capital T truth in there, which reflects the the fractal of nature, but trying to say that anything that is, his, that is factual is true. There's the problem, <laughs> you know, you're mixing up fiction and reality. So, but that's a, uh, We'll continue on that. I want to give a couple quotes here. Um, we're nearing the end of the first hour. We'll probably go a little over. That's okay. I'm, I'm just I quoted these on stuff. Weaving Spiders Welcome last weekend, but I'm going to do it again. Godfrey Higgins. God. <laughs> uh, okay, this is going to be a couple of long quotes. You're cool with that, though, right? Yeah, you're good, bro. Okay, Godfrey Higgins from Anacolapsis. Anacolapsis. Anacolapsis, thank you. Yeah, he wrote... The, myth, the mythos of the Hindus, the mythos of the Jews, and the mythos of the Greeks are all at the bottom the same, and what are called their early histories are not the histories of man, but are contrivances under the appearance of histories to perpetuate doctrines. 
or perhaps the history of certain religious opinions in a manner understood by those only who had a key to the enigma. After giving the subject all the consideration in my power and a diligent examination of ancient documents for many years, I have become quite convinced that almost all of the ancient histories were written for the sole purpose of recording mythos, which it was desired to transmit to posterity. But yet to conceal from all but the initiated, the traditions of the countries were made subservient to this purpose without any suspicion of fraud, and we only give them the appearance of fraud when we confound them with history. This is the case with all early histories. They were all anciently composed, or if written, they were written in verse for the sake of correct retention by the memory, and set to music for the same reason. They were all the same nature as the Iliad and the Aeneid. The most ancient of the ancients had nothing of the nature of real histories. Now I'm going to do a shorter quote here. This is from Dylan Sicocio, uh, the author of the Spirit World book series, which I highly recommend. I did an audio book of uh, Spirit World July's End. And before too long, I'll be producing his newest book as well. By who? Dylan Sicocio. Mm, I'll make sure you got a link to this so people can check out the audio book uh, of the one that I did. But here's a, here's a short quote from him. Ancient people used original zodiacal or astrological charts to create history and renowned figures, localities, kings, etc., and then also applied them to geography. The myths came first and then they used it to forge a historical narrative. They turned allegory into history, <laughs> but not just any allegory. The allegories were astrological. So the reason why I bring this up is to get back to that point of truth versus fact, okay? So history is always going to be hearsay. It's always going to be somebody's version of it. You know, our memories are like that. Two people are at the same place. You ask them what happened, different story. But whenever you apply mythological allegory and make that history, and that mythological allegory is zodiacal in nature, reflecting capital T truth of nature, which would be the seasons and cycles nature goes through, then your history has the feeling and the ring of truth. And now we're conflating truth and fact, right? We're, we're believing in fiction as reality because that fiction has got the flavor of truth and it does have truth in it if you understand it allegorically. And this is what the Bible is. The Bible is exactly that. It is <laughs> allegory that has been taken as literal history or, or whatever, but in fact, all the value in it is in that allegorical truth of nature level, not in the, this really happened just like this on this day, you know? That's how we get the dark ages. Cause people, I, I, I've always said that there's a mystical comprehension of things and there's a literal comprehension. There you and go. I think some people aren't able to decipher between the two, you know, and not even able to decide because of all these archontic forces at work that are shaping and, Absolutely. What you mentioned earlier, like, you know, your reality is what you make of it, what your aura, what you project out these projections, you know, Carl Jung talked about projecting these things out into the world. That's also very important because you live the reality that you project outward, you know, by, by what you ingest, because health is not just what you eat or what you drink or what you vape or whatever. It's also about what you intake with your eyes and, and, and your brain and your soul, whatever you want to call it, you know, that's also plays a role because a lot of people take the mainstream narrative for, you know, as a fact, hundred percent without looking at it from a different lens and, and opening up their eyes to see it from a different point of view. And absolutely. And have you, have you read uh, an eclipsis that that's a very fascinating, it's a very long read, but it's, it's some, no, I, I've only got excerpts from it that are particularly good. <laughs> Bro, that's, but that obviously he's on to some shit. <laughs> oh, dude. He said that supposedly he said that he worked on that 10 hours a day for 20 years in order to complete that work. Man, we're just, we're really fortunate to live in the era of history where that actually is possible, where that type of work is coming to the fore, where we can yeah. compile all these things and be like, it's all the same shit. Yeah. But let's wrap it up, man. Let people know about one-on-one -on -one and like where to find you and what you're excited about that you've been doing recently, give them the, the plugs and all that. So, so we can move uh, over to hour two. I've been, you know, you can find me, excuse me, at, at the one on one podcast, anywhere you listen to your podcast at YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, all that good stuff. Rockfin. 
uh, patreon.com slash the one one podcast. I run a podcast to talk about conspiracies and all kind of esoteric and occult subjects, you know, things like how we're talking about today and just the very fabric of reality. You can find me on there and, and yeah, dude, I'm excited to get to the second hour to, so we see, to see what we can dig up. <laughs> yeah. I think we're going to talk about reptilians, right? I'll go get my yeah. Sabak books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to uh, hear so about that. my plugs for your, since this is a swap cast is where you find all my stuff, do a weekly show. It is definitely like conspirituality could be on either side of the equation and usually both. And I also have a live show on Wednesday nights called Vibrant on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Central. And that's really fun. A lot of community interaction. If you tune in, you could like leave us a voicemail or maybe even call in potentially. Uh, hang out on Weaving Spiders Welcome most Saturday nights as well. And I highly recommend that YouTube channel. Great, great stuff. Uh, so you can. All, all that and more <laughs> at my website. You can find the sound healing services that I'm up to. I'll make sure that that gets linked in the show notes. It always does on on my end. I'll send one the links too. Yeah. Where uh, we haven't really talked about it, but this is a service I do for clients where I use tuning forks and it works remotely to balance and and strengthen the different layers of your auric field and is a real mechanical, real consistent process that has amazing results due to the biofield anatomy being similar for everybody. And uh, maybe we'll talk about that more in the second hour, possibly yes. uh, definitely talk about reptiles, <laughs> reptilians. That'll be fun. And I'll also do Oracle card readings for clients. That's another thing I want to put out there. I'd, I'd use I Ching and tarot. And if you hit me up, we can schedule a session and have some spiritual counseling and guidance where you tap into what you really feel and think about stuff with the cards as the, as the universe talking to you. So yeah, man, this has been a really, <laughs> we covered a lot of ground in the first yeah, hour. So lady. many places to go, bro. It's crazy. All right. Well, thanks, man. Thank you, Chance. <laughs>